Thank you for joining me for this uh, online presentation for EGU. It is recorded during the COVID lockdown, so as you can see, I'm recording from home. And we will be joined by some of uh, my co-authors who sent me their video contributions. We would like to present research that uh, we have done on how to account for changing the positional rates in uh, interpreting paleo-environmental proxies. So we have chosen a case study in which we investigate um, redox proxies, uh, that is uh, redox sensitive elements, um, during a large carbon isotope excursion. But the inspiration for our approach comes from paleontological studies and particularly how paleontologists deal with time averaging. I will start by explaining the problem uh, using fossils. Uh, Fossil assemblages are really important in reconstructing paleo environments, but that hinges on them having a high resolution so uh, that they record a particular moment in time. And that would be the case in this bedding plane assemblage of fossils uh, from Anticosti, where you can see they are extremely well preserved, articulated, and they probably almost met. Um, but if we see a sudden change uh, in the abundance or composition of uh, fossils, it could be an ecological effect. That means that uh, there was a sudden boost in productivity um, or an invasion. But it could also mean um, that uh, it is driven by sedimentological changes. For example, a storm layer that brings uh, fossils from somewhere else. Uh, it could be, um, for example, intensive burrowing that accumulates particular shells in particular levels, and it could be a change in the depositional rate. The effect of changing depositional rates on fossil accumulation has been modeled by Susan Kidwell in this uh, seminal paper from 1985. Um, these two fictional uh, computer-generated uh, sedimentary sections are colored according to how uh, large is the volume of fossils in them. The darker the color, the more fossils. And uh, the model had two parameters, sediment input, which is the solid line here, and the input of uh, fossils, um, that's the dashed line. And you can see that um, if we have ecological change, such as uh, higher or lower productivity, um, we can uh, obtain them uh, without changing uh, the sedimentation at all. But we can obtain the same um, effects uh, by not changing anything in the input of shells, but just changing the depositional rate. But the same factors that affect the resolution of fossil assemblages principally apply to any sedimentary particles. Uh, so very often we want to understand the links between changes uh, in the biota and the environment. Um, in the younger strata, this is dealt with by transforming uh, using absolute age models. But as you go deeper in Earth history, absolute ages are less and less available. So if you want to work in the Paleozoic, you often need an alternative solution. We tried to find one by applying the DIME model uh, developed by Niklas Homan, principally for fossils, um, to transform um, paleo-environmental proxies using relative age models. Um, and uh, as a case study, we've chosen a section called Podut, uh, which is located uh, on the Swedish island of Gotland. And Gotland is famous for its exquisite Silurian uh, tropical carbonates. And uh, I will hand over to Axel Moneke to introduce this section. So, why Podut? Uh, the outcrop Boat Oud is located on Gotland, on the southwest coast of Gotland, and the outcrop conditions are actually quite variable, uh, sometimes very good, sometimes uh, almost not accessible. It depends on the sea level of the modern Baltic Sea. The outcrop exposes just a few meter of sediment that include or that comprise the uh, rising limb of the so-called Lau excursion. The Lau excursion is probably the strongest short-lived positive carbon isotope excursion of the whole Phanerozoic, and the, the causes of this strong perturbation of the carbon cycle are still under debate. However, there is some evidence that it is associated with anoxia, and that is the reason why we investigated the geochemical uh, 
signature here in this outcrop. The lithology uh, is in this outcrop uh, developed as um, almost barren, deep platform marls in the lowermost part of the section that gradually pass into more and more bioplastic uh, limestones and marls and finally into oncolytic limestones of the Eke formation. The lowermost part is uppermost Hemse formation, Hemse group. Uh, so it represents almost a textbook example of a gradual regression. The carbon isotope values here in the section um, they rise from about 1 per mil, plus 1 per mil, up to plus 7 per mil. The rock samples were used in three ways. For bike-rock isotope analysis, for carbonate content analysis, and for trace element analysis in the carbonate content. For bike-rock isotope analysis, the samples were cleaned and powdered using a hand drill. Carbon isotopes were measured using a gas bench tube connected to a mass spectrometer. For carbonate content, the samples were crushed and powdered in an agate motor. The carbonate content was determined by reacting the powdered sample with 10% hydrochloric acid in a carbonate pump. For trace element analysis, the powdered sample was dissolved in one molar acetic acid to extract only and only measure the carbonate fraction. This was done to measure only the hydrogenous orthogonic phase representing the composition of seawater, because bicroc analysis would include the detrital phase of trace element concentration. The trace element concentration from ICPMS measurements were normalized to post archaean Australian shale and divided by the carbonate content of the respective sample to obtain the actual trace element concentrations. Here we show you a selection of these redox proxies uh, that is vanadium, nickel, cesium, uranium, europium and cerium anomalies. And they are shown against uh, the section and the increasing carbon isotopes. You can see that vanadium, nickel and cesium show a very prominent peak at uh, the level near the onset of the excursion. Uh, whereas uranium doesn't really change very much, it shows high levels uh, in the base of the section. Uh, so overall we see a very high variability of these proxies in the lower part and a gradual decrease and a very stable, uh, almost no changes in the upper part uh, when the excursion starts. And uh, in the europium and cerium anomalies we see sort of mirrored curves uh, showing opposite trends um, in the upper part and a very high variability without major tendencies uh, in the lower part. And now a question is, since we know that this interval records a continuous gradual regression, we're going from the out uh, platform environment to shallow water environments with a higher carbonate production, how are these peaks and these tendencies uh, affected by the change in the depositional rate? There are no absolute ages available at Budut, so we had to come up with uh, relative age models and they are based on uh, the, de the facious model for this type of environment. We are at the edge of a carbon platform and during the regression we are uh, moving towards the center of it. So um, from the sedimentology conformation we can reconstruct the relative uh, um, intensity of the position. Um, one proxy that we have used is thorium input. Uh, thorium has multiple isotopes present in the environment, but only one is abundant and long-lived enough to be detectable and relevant. That's thorium-232. Uh, it is produced uh, by a weathering in, in the hinterland, and we assume that uh, its input is approximately constant, but as we move towards the center of the carbonate platform, it is diluted by carbonate. Um, we don't know how well this uh, proxy will perform, therefore we compared it with uh, two other proxies. Um, the second one is the carbonate content. We assumed that carbonate uh, production in the Paleozoic was in situ, there was no pelagic carbonate factory, therefore the more uh, carbonate you have in your rock sample, the closer you are to the site of production, so to the shallow water environment and um, the faster the deposition is. And a third independent uh, model is uh, the proportion of pelagic polynomials per rock volume. Uh, we combined three groups 
prosinophytes and acritars, which are phytoplankton, and chitinozoans, which are zooplankton. Um, they are all organic world, and uh, they have all been documented to have a pelagic type of distribution. Therefore, the input into the sediment should be independent on the depositional rate, and the more we find uh, of these uh, organic world fossils, uh, the slower the depositional rate was. To account for the effects of changing deposition rates, we use the DIME model. It is based on the idea that if we have an age model, we can actually take the time of deposition of an object in the sediment and transform it into stratigraphic height and of course vice versa. This idea directly expands to intervals, so everything that is placed in the sediment in interval A will be found in interval B in the section and everything that is found in interval B in the section has been placed in the sediment in the interval A. This can be expanded to input rates. So any input rate into the sediment in time can be transferred into the observable content uh, of that input in the section. The first is that we take the assumed thorium input through time, which we argue is constant, and the observed thorium content in the, strat in the section. And then we can ask the question, what H model would transform one into the other? And this will be the reconstructed thorium H model. This can be repeated for the different proxies of deposition rates we use. So it, this will give us uh, three different H models, one for thorium, one for carbonate content, and one based on the pelagic polynomorphs. Once these H models are established, we can use them to transform data from the section into relative time. As an example, this is the observed vanadium content in the section combined with the thorium H model, and as a result, we get a reconstructed vanadium curve through relative time. I would like to show you the results using the thorium-based relative H model. This is the model that most strongly deviates from a constant depositional rate. On this figure, um, the values are mapped into the time realm, so this is how the record of these events would look like if we had constant depositional rate. The thick red line are the transformed values and the blue line in the background is uh, the original signal. And you can see that uh, the onset of the carbon isotop excursion has moved up by almost a meter, so it was in fact even more abrupt uh, than it appeared in the section. Whereas um, the lower dep um, part of the section had low depositional rates, which enhanced the peaks uh, in redox sensitive elements and uh, after transformation they appear much less pronounced and the decreasing tendency which we have seen in the section has almost disappeared. Also uh, this uh, low depositional rate increased the condensation of uranium in the sediment and after transformation we see a decrease by 45% in the actual value. Um, in the upper part of the section we hardly had any tendency in the redox sensitive proxies uh, originally, but because uh, this is where the depositional rate uh, speeds up, after transformation we see an increasing tendency, especially in vanadium, and uh, the levels with high concentrations are even more pronounced now. So um, this is an example that accounting for depositional rates in extreme cases can uh, re reverse the tendencies in the proxies that we see in a section. Thank you for joining us for this presentation. Uh, I would like to thank the session organizers and EGU for keeping this event online. And uh, I am also grateful to my co-authors and everybody who helped us in lab and uh, field work. I hope we have convinced you that uh, we can account for changing the positional rates, uh, even, we don't, if, if we, even if we don't have uh, absolute ages and if you are curious to test this method you can download the dime package for our software for free and i would be very curious to hear your comments and feedback and uh, thank you again